Um, so, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Angela Roberts. I'm Deputy CEO at Care and Support West, and a warm welcome to you all for this clinical update session, um, in which we're going to welcome Laura Picton, CQ um, pharmacist, whose slides you can see ready on the screen. That will be by the Get You Better app team from BNSSG, and we welcome Gavin Ford for that. And he'll be supported by colleagues from Abel Cares, French A House, and Belvedere Lodge. Finally, we'll have Sarah Ambe from Catalyst Care Group, and you're all very welcome. Uh, please note that we will be recording this session and the recording will be on the website later. As we go along, you'll find it helpful to stay on mute, um, but please do put your questions in the chat box and I'll do my best to pick those up as we go along. <clears throat> I say that because sometimes it's hard to see the chat box if the screen is being shared, but we'll, we'll give it our best shot. Um, a couple of notices from me. I'd like to say a thank you to everybody who put in nominations for this year's Care and Support West Care Awards. Uh, the judging has now taken place and I'd like to say uh, make a public vote of thanks to all of the 20 judges um, without whom the whole thing really wouldn't work. They're judges from uh, our sector and actually slightly to the side of it and um, we're really delighted to have them all on board. Um, we're now looking forward to a great celebration of care in October, the format of which is yet to be confirmed, as you can imagine. I just have one note for your diary. On the 25th of May, we're hosting a webinar on supporting student nurse placements in social care. If you already host placements or are interested in hearing more about them, please do come along. So the 25th of May, um, bookings are through the events page of our website. Right. That's it from me. Laura, I'm going to hand over to you now. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, Angela asked me to give a, a, a sort of quick clinical update um, from a medicines and pharmacy point of view. Um, so I thought I'd think about sort of what's changed over the last year. What have we seen um, differences in post pandemic she says optimistically um to, to what we were seeing pre-pandemic and i thought the, the two biggest areas that we've seen most change have been around use of oxygen and pulse oximetry and diabetes in particular delegation of insulin administration so i'm going to have a quick run through those two topics um, and then um, give you some resources at the end um, as Angela said, I can't see the chat box while I'm sharing my screen, which is a bit unfortunate, but we'll, we'll rattle through. If you've got some questions, please do either pop them in the chat or hold on to them. And I'll pause at the end of each section. I'll just ask Angela if there is anything to pick up. Um, and then hopefully there'll be a few minutes at the end as well. Um, I've shared the slide set, so they are available for you in a PDF form because there's quite a lot of links to resources and things at the end. So don't worry about trying to scribble those down as we go through. Hopefully you'll be able to get those afterwards. So we're going to start off talking about oxygen and pulse oximetry. So a little bit of a refresher. So people receiving adult social care may receive oxygen therapy and oxygen therapy involves breathing air that contains more oxygen than the normal air around us and that's obtained via a cylinder or via a machine called a concentrator. Um, it's a prescribed medicine so it's prescribed for people who have a condition that causes low oxygen levels and people recovering from COVID are more likely to require oxygen therapy. We're also seeing that people post-COVID are being discharged, particularly into nursing homes with new tracheostomies. Um, and management of a tracheostomy is a nursing task. So long-term oxygen therapy can be given either via a tube placed under the nose, as in the gentleman in the picture, that's a nasal cannula, by a face mask over the nose and mouth, or by a mask attached to a tracheostomy, so an opening in the throat. An oxygen must only be prescribed by a specialist after a full clinical review, and that person would normally be a respiratory healthcare professional. So they will do the initial prescribing and they'll decide the flow rate, how long oxygen should be used for. They'll document the clinical reason for oxygen prescribing. Records um, should be kept in people's care plans. 
and potentially on their medicines administration record as well. We, we'd be looking to make sure that staff know exactly why the person is using oxygen, how much they're using, what their normal oxygen saturations should be. There should be an escalation plan for that person. And you should know who to contact if the person becomes unwell or you need to escalate their care. You should also include the fact that they're using oxygen in their personal emergency evacuation plan. And you can liaise with the, the fire service in your area to make sure that they're aware that the person's using oxygen and that you're storing oxygen in, in your service or in the person's own home. Um, there should be a really clear risk assessment that should be reviewed at least annually or more often if there's any changes or concerns about the person's oxygen use. Um, masks and tubing should be kept clean and in good condition and obviously only used for the person for whom they were prescribed for, particularly important with infection prevention and control. Um, and oxygen cylinders in particular do have a date on them so it's important to make sure that the equipment is in date and to make sure that if you're storing cylinders, that they're stored securely. They're, the big ones are big, heavy um, metal cylinders that can cause damage if they fall. And obviously that can be dangerous and a fire risk as well. So you should have a policy around oxygen use if you've got people that are, are using oxygen in your service. Um, like I said, it should only ever be prescribed for people and shouldn't be used on, a, on an as required basis it should be prescribed for a set number of hours in a, in a day. Um, liaison with fire and emergency services is important and also informing the power network as well so in, informing your um, electricity supplier and particularly if people are using oxygen concentrators and you don't have a backup of cylinders really important because obviously if the power goes off that concentrator isn't going to be working anymore need to think about now that people are sort of able to to access the outside a little bit thinking about how you would support a person who uses oxygen to have trips away from your service if it's a residential service so thinking about maybe the portable cylinders and how you'll manage those and then making sure care plans include um, information about particular fire risks. So obviously risks around smoking with oxygen being a, an, an accelerant um, to a fire and that, that being a significant risk. But also thinking about other heat sources such as heaters or electronic equipment, laptops, iPads that can get hot, um, aerosols, other flammable liquids. And also really important to think about topical emollients. So um, the creams, lotions, ointments that uh, people apply for, for dry skin. So things like Diprobase, Double Base, for example, Aveeno. Any emollient um, can be uh, an accelerant again in a fire and can reduce the ignition temperature for a fire and people still we still um, get copied into coroner's notices where people have died because of a, a fire associated with use of a topical emollient and oxygen can be an additional risk there as well. Um, oxygen cylinders and concentrators are supplied by uh, an, an oxygen supplier. So they're, they're each local CCG area has a contract and they're supplied directly. And that organisation are responsible for the maintenance um, and for yeah, fixing any faults or arranging replacements. So you should contact them if any of the equipment that you're using becomes faulty or needs replacing. So oxygen is carried around the body in red blood cells and it can be measured as a, as a percentage of um, oxygen saturation in the blood. So it's a percentage scored out of 100 and it can be measured by using a sensor that's placed onto the fingertip. This is called a pulse oximeter and it measures how much light is absorbed by the blood and that tells clinicians how much oxygen is in the blood. So that's a really useful tool, particularly at the moment where we know that, that COVID has a real um, risk around oxygen levels in the blood and can be identified by low oxygen levels. So 
clinical teams in hospitals and in the community use pulse oximetry to support people living in their own homes or care homes in the diagnosis of acute illness or for longer term conditions that might need some monitoring. Many GP practices and community teams are supporting use of pulse oximetry in care homes and NHS England has um, a new a newish scheme around supporting pulse oximetry in care homes and there's various documents and training modules that are available and I've put the links to those at the end. Uh, people are at risk of poor outcomes um, with significantly low oxygen levels and pulse oximetry can be quite a simple way to measure and identify what's called silent hypoxia. So this can be the first sign of a poor outcome after testing positive for COVID. And it's, um, it's where oxygen saturation levels in the body are low, but the patient doesn't appear to be short of breath. So in the first wave, so this sort of time last year, clinicians noticed that SATs of 93% or lower and were a predictor of patients requiring ITU admission or of death following COVID. And those people at that point of recording that, that reading of 93% may not be showing any obvious signs of struggling for, for breath or, or any signs or symptoms of COVID. So this is what led to the, the need for a system to monitor people using um, home pulse oximetry. We've received quite a lot of questions into the medicines inquiries inbox about pulse oximetry. I mean, it's not in itself a medicine, but uh, the questions have been coming in, um, asking mostly about sort of what the regulatory impact is of that and whether services need to register for diagnostic and screening services. The care providers wouldn't normally be registered for diagnostic and screening procedures um, and they don't need to if they are offering spot recording using pulse oximetry. That's exempt from, from registration for this regulated activity. So if you're, if you're just doing spot recording, so testing people every now and then, then you don't need to register for a different regulated activity. What you do need is trained and competent staff. So you staff need to understand how to use the equipment and they really importantly understand what to do with the measurements and the results that they're obtaining. Know where to, to escalate those, know where to ask for advice and support. So before we move on and just touch on diabetes and insulin delegation, is there any questions about oxygen or pulse oximetry, Angela? There's, there's nothing in the box yet, Laura. Brilliant, lovely, yeah. right, let's crack on. So diabetes, this is the other area that we had an awful lot of questions about, particularly around insulin um, delegation. I'm, I'm gonna skip over these just because we're a little bit short on time, but the information will be there when you when you get the slide pack later on. What's really important with insulin is people uh, with diabetes, sorry, people can um, have very high or very low blood sugar levels. It's really, really important that care plans for people with diabetes recognize how that um, presents for that individual person. So what does an individual person um, that might be suffering with hypoglycemia, so low glucose levels, what does that look like for them? Do they have a headache? Are they shaky? Are they confused? Um, and what do your staff need to do about it? So how, how do they monitor people? What action do they take if they believe a person might be having a, um, a low blood glucose level? Similarly for high blood glucose levels as well, this isn't as much of an immediate risk to people's health, but it is a longer term risk. So high blood glucose um, can be seen by passing more urine, especially at night, being very thirsty, headaches again, tiredness and lethargy. Um, but if it's left untreated, high blood glucose level can cause damage in the body. So it's important, again, that the care plan covers off 
what needs to happen if a person has high blood glucose levels. So a number of different um, screening processes and health monitoring that, that diabetic patients um, uh, are able to receive. Anybody that's over 12 years of age should be receiving all of these nine processes at least annually. And obviously these are delivered by healthcare professionals. So either by the GP or by a diabetic specialist nurse maybe. Um, but we would expect care providers to support and enable people to be able to access these processes and procedures. All of that needs to be recorded in a diabetes care plan. And that diabetes care plan should include um, information about medicines in um, administration as well. So just going to move on to talk about insulin. So this is where we've seen the biggest change. So insulin can be used for people with type 2 diabetes where um, oral medicines, tablets or maybe diet haven't been effective and it's always used for type 1 diabetes. Um, and we've seen a significant increase in delegation of insulin administration via the insulin pen. So the insulin administration is a nursing task because it's an injection. Um, it's piercing the skin. So it um, is a task that would normally be delivered by community nurses or by nurses in a nursing home. But that task can be delegated to care staff. And we've seen an increasing um, amount of that, particularly during this time last year. But that is, is going. So as community district nursing teams were finding it increasingly difficult to, to get out into the community, a number of nurses have been called back to acute roles. More um, insulin administration was being delegated to care staff. NHS England um, have, have produced a standard operating procedure and a draft policy around insulin delegation. And that's hosted on the Diabetes UK website. And we were a stakeholder in that, um, in that development. So it's something that we support the, the framework that's laid out in that, that document. Um, the most important thing with delegation again comes back to staff um, training and uh, accountability. So if a care worker is, is taking on a delegated task, they must have very clear um, training and competence, and there must be a, a delegating authority. So somebody, a nursing team or an individual nurse who retains the accountability and responsibility for, the, for their action. And that person needs to be assured that the staff, care staff, are suitably trained and competent to deliver it. Um, we're more than happy to answer any questions you might have about delegation because it is quite um, tricky and quite contentious sometimes. And you should only ever accept a delegated task if you feel confident that your staff are able to deliver it and that you've got enough staff to deliver it as well. I'm just going to rattle through these because we're running out of time, but you will be able to look at them. This is just some resources that we've produced. So this is our um, medicines report that you might be interested in. And this is the one that I wanted to show you. So this is the link to our, our website. And this is where all of our medicines information pages are hosted. We've got medicines information on the topics that we've talked about, but many, many other topics besides. So if you are, if you think, you know, what would CQC think about that? Or what does the regulation say about that particular medicines topic? Then please have a look at the website. Um, and if you can't find the information you're looking for on there, please do contact us for further advice. We've got the email address at the bottom there. And we're more than happy to, to pick up your um, particular inquiries through that inbox. We'd much rather that, that you, and you ask for help than, than you know, sort of struggling on alone and, and maybe not making quite the right decision. So please do come and ask for us for help. Right, I'm going to leave it there and go to the any other questions slide. Um, I don't know whether anybody has anything that they want to ask. I've 
conscious that there's a lot of information that I've gone through very quickly. You have. There. there there's nothing in the chat box yet, Laura. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if people are sitting there just absorbing all of <laughs> it. And, um, I will remind them, as, as you've said, that, that um, I've got the slides and we will put those up on our web website on the events page linked to um, uh, the, um, sorry, my, my brain just went away for a minute, <laughs> uh, linked to this recording. Um, so that, that will all um, be there for people. Brilliant. Um, I'm just checking the, the box again. Um, nothing, um, nothing yet. Perhaps if people have got shy this morning. Is anybody using pulse oximetry in the homes, in your services? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And how's that going? How are you finding it? Um, very useful. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, yeah. We've, we've restored two forms. Yes. To do observations. Yeah. Brilliant. And are you getting the, the clinical support that you need to, to be able to do that? Yeah, all our staff have had training. And, Brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, good, good. Um, what about insulin delegation? Has anybody been asked to, to pick up insulin administration over the, the last year? No. No, um, no I think that's... Sorry, sorry, Morris, no, come on, sorry. They use it for new admission new yep. and restore to. Yes, brilliant. Yep, excellent. No, that's great. The insulin <clears throat> delegation seems to be um, quite CCG or ICS level now specific. So there'll be yeah. a, a decision at a system level that they want to move insulin administration away from community nursing teams over to care so that so it does tend to be quite local and some ccgs have gone wholesale right across and you'll find if you look at the diabetes uk information that there's some pilot sites um gloucester i think was one of the pilot sites um where quite a lot of their insulin administration has moved across to to care staff so that might be something that you might want to look at at some point in the future mm. Um, somebody's just put in the chat box um, diabetes care plan who provides this for someone with type 2, two diabetes the diabetes care plan so we'd expect a, 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 an adult social care service to write their own care plan but to to use information from um, specialists so to use information that might come from the GP or from the diabetes specialist team, from the person themselves, it's really important as well to know, yeah. you know what's their experience of managing their own diabetes if, if they have been doing that previously. Um, and just to make it really personalized. Of course. Uh, um, just one more question um, from Shirley. We would be interested for you to point us in the direction of some training for pulse oximetry. Um, is there is there such a thing? Um, because she says it seems that not all staff understand how to use the pulse oximeters and we're getting very varied re results. Yeah, so on, let me just go to the next slide a minute. So the second that bullet point there is a link to Health Education England training on pulse oximetry. So that would be the one That's that I would course. point to. Um, I'm not sure that, that whether that goes into the you know, how each individual pulse oximeter works. Um, so if you're getting variability, I would take that up with the clinical team that are supporting you. Is that, is that okay, Shirley? Does that help? Hopefully it does. I'm, I'm, yes, she says yes, thanks. And, Brilliant, lovely. Um, and Karen has said that she's, she came from a home being able to give insulin in Gloucestershire but not a yep. to in South yes. Coast. So it, it is obviously a variable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Gloucester were one of the pilot areas <clears throat> right. um, that worked with the NHS England team and Diabetes UK to draft the framework and the standard operating procedures. So, yeah, and I, I think it's something we, we will see increasingly um, yeah. in, in more areas. It will become more commonplace. Right. Okay, I'm conscious. Lovely. Now, technically, I think the best thing, Laura, is for if you if you stop screen sharing and then I'll withdraw. Yeah. 
oh where have you gone <laughs> it's all moved oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh there you are right I'll just take the co-hosting away from you yep brilliant I will hand it over to Gavin hi Gavin is that okay with you Gavin if I do that make you co-host of course yeah thanks Angela yeah okay bye, right. off we go and then I'll take that back from you when, once your piece is finished okay I'm going to hand over to Gavin now and um with, with support from um, Karen and Amanda. Over to you, thank you. Thanks Andrew, thanks also. I'm Gavin from the Get You Better team and um, I say Amanda and uh, Karen have just joined me this morning just to sort of, um, I think, bring you or make you aware, if you like, of some work which we're doing or piloting right now in the CCG uh, into care homes um, for musculoskeletal um, self-management, basically. So I'm part of the Get You Better team. Um, we're a team of physios who are Bristol based and we've basically uh, created um, a set of recovery pathways for people who may be suffering from, um, for example, back, knee, ankle, neck, shoulder, calf injuries. And what we've actually created is based on NICE national guidelines is, a, is, a, is content, content which includes videos, and tips, um, recovery plans, uh, diarised entries and so on for somebody to use inside their smartphone or their tablet or desktop. Sorry, can I just check you're hearing me okay? There's quite a lot of feedback going through. Is it okay, you okay Angela? Is it okay? Yeah. Um, Sorry, so, yeah. I can I can hear you okay. There does seem to be feedback. If I could ask those who aren't speaking to remain on mute, please. Thanks. Um, and in doing so, we've done this to try to, if you like, do two things. Primarily, just to try and relieve a bit of pressure on frontline sources as a resource. So, try and uh, reduce the number of appointments going into physio. Try and reduce the number of people seeing GPs on a repeat basis. Uh, but also, importantly, give back to individuals content and information and the knowledge, if you like, to enable them to confidently self-manage their own recovery. What's currently happening, so we're being commissioned by the CCG to roll this out to all the practices in BNFSG. Uh, we're pretty much there now, about 15 practices are now using the app. And we've just started well working with Karen and Mandy in the Able Care, uh, Belvedere and French Homes. So I'll just quickly let you know what the app is, and then I think Karen and Mandy are going to share their experience actually today. So um, how it generally works uh, is that the user signs into their into an app, having been given access from their GP, and they then basically record into the app their recovery date and how they are getting on. And based on that, they'll then receive information which is uh, relevant to them, or physiotherapy type information, relevant to them on how they are in their recovery. Who's it for? It's basically for all ages, anyone over 18 and there and above. And it's for anybody who may have a new injury, so an injury occurred in the last 12 weeks, or an injury which is recurrent, so it keeps coming back on a regular basis. Uh, and by using the, the app or the sort of condition pathways, the user can then begin to understand how to help them progress and think about their own condition. This is very, very, very sort of busy. I won't go into the detail, but what it's trying to do as well is if you like join together the whole, if you like, patient experience across various points in the healthcare system. So we're focused on the primary care, GPs and SCPs, and they're the people we're currently supporting in the rollout. And in handing out the app to patients, we're also then linking those patients to their local services and rehab support and social support through the app as well. We also work very closely with the secondary care physio teams you know, in, in South Mead and BRI and so on. And they are also potentially thinking about giving the app out to people on their waiting lists. So people who may be waiting for secondary care may get the app, use the app, that might help them get better, or work alongside their recovery. And then we're also now working with long-term care as well, um, particularly with Escape Pain. We have an Escape Pain program coming into the app. For us now with, uh, I guess, if you like, the care homes with Karen and Mandy, it's actually saying, actually, how can we sort of reach into 
that populace of people who are not who have been perhaps forgotten in sort of like the self management sort of area and provide a service which is free which which potentially the care workers and or the residents themselves could use to help them with their particular problems so what a patient actually gets effectively is in their pocket if you like or on their desktop um, physio support or, or information which they'd be getting if they were seeing a physio uh, for all those conditions and you can have multiple conditions for you um, you have a condition pathway which reflects local services and local pathways so it doesn't it's not generic it's all reconfigured into the bnssg way that physio teams want to work how they manage all their, their sort of care. Uh, the user gets personalized content so what they get is based upon how they're feeling if they're improving the same or worse or different they actually get better they get prevention with, uh, information it's all based on, a, on an easy to find dashboard from where they can sort of fit in and out for their, uh, for their videos and tips to guide and exercises. And stuff. So, so far, generally, how our patients or how the users are finding is what we're trying to do is get people to begin to address their recovery, build their knowledge, confidence, and skill to do things and manage their condition themselves. Importantly, not leave them feeling isolated, still crudely out connecting back into practice and GP when necessary, and also signpost to other services in the area which they can use if and when needed. And solutions to the standardization of care, looking to prevent over treatment, less GP visits, less medication. That's the benefit we're tracking to date, uh, both here and in other areas of working as well. So I mentioned that we're currently working with the two teams in Belvedere and French uh, and working to sort of try and understand how we can bring it into a care home environment or a sort of support care environment. So perhaps um, uh, I can have a quick question there or perhaps Mandy and Karen would perhaps like to just share their experience and their sort of findings to date. Hello. There you go. So, Mandy and Karen, if you want to. Yeah. Do you want me to go first, Karen? Okay. Hi, it's Mandy here from Belvedere Lodge. So, I'm home care manager for 19 bedded um, home style type residential and we've been using the get you better app for about six weeks would be about that i've been doing that with two residents plus then myself by myself learning what i need to support my residents with both my residents have advanced levels of dementia and one of them has learning disability with Down syndrome as well. So for him, um, we are needing to show him what to do. He suffers with osteoarthritis, so I'm trying to minimise impact of age-related condition. I'm trying to help him strengthen what ability he has got and to maintain his mobility. He tends to walk looking at the floor. So um, the way I've been using the app is with his back because he gets neck and back ache and but can't tell you where his pain is due to his learning disability. So we have to monitor through his body language. So each day I've been working with him to help strengthen his back, doing exercises which promote his mobility and standing up straight. He's definitely um, curvature of the spine and about having the confidence to walk um, independently, which he can do without looking at the floor all the time. So by promoting some of the exercises which are on the app itself, looking at strengthening um, and supporting and maintaining his ability, I've been able to get him to do some of those exercises. They're short, brief exercises, no more than 20 to 30 seconds, some a bit less. 
we as staff um, are his advocate because he lacks capacity through the dementia and learning disability. So we are supporting him to do those. My other lady that we're doing it with has osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, age related um, skeletal muscular aches and pains. She's on a pain patch and on regular pain relief. She has fractured ribs and a fractured wrist, which is mending. But again, through the app, we are getting her to strengthen herself um, through mobility. Um, she can't follow the actual videos themselves, but by us watching them, she is able then to follow us. So we work side by side with her and she will stand up, she'll look at the ceiling, she'll pull in, she's strengthening all her spine. So what I've then done is gone through my own support and I've explored um, neck and spine, neck and back, lower areas, and I've been able to do all the exercises. So it's, it really is ability-based, but you can adapt. And I think there's some work that would be coming forward for adaptation for people that perhaps can't get into a cat position, cow position, get on the floor. I can still do that, so I do. But we're also needing to have a look at how we support those that can't, what can we do to adapt? What I have found is by exploring the app itself is it's given me the greater knowledge to be able to support those that perhaps are stooping, shuffling, not walking promptly, effectively. It's promoted my own um, awareness to our residents to say, oh, stand up straight, walk nice and strong, good steps, all of those lovely reminders to help support the people that we're, we're supporting. The app itself has got a wealth of um, videos, um, advice, some tips about strengthening um, and how to progress. So really good tool from our side, but it does need a lot of support from staff to be able for them to be able to carry that out. All right. Hi, thanks, Mandy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, again, I'm from Brittany House. We're also trialing the app. At the moment, three of my staff are actively trialing the app. Um, we're really benefiting from the personalised treatment. Um, the videos are great. It's easy, accessible, it's targeted and and personalised self-management information to help data and data. We're hoping to reduce problems returning, um, which we have done in one of our residents. Um, the symptom checking is really beneficial and the monitoring of recovery. We're promoting well-being and improving movement for the residents. Um, and the exercises are based on the stage of recovery. So with a few sessions a day or a week, it's proven beneficial. And the app is really giving the staff the reassurance that they are aiding recovery and helping everybody. So we've got two residents that we're using it for at the moment. Um, one is historical. He had a broken hip and shoulder last year. Um, but he's been slowly on the mend and obviously because of the pandemic, um, we haven't been able to have anyone in to help. Um, so we started the exercises with him on the app. And like Mandy said, they're only short, but they're proving really effective. And we're hoping through the self-management, we can fix those issues for him. So he's walking a lot better. He was using his frame. He's now reverted to his stick, which he had pre-full. So we're really happy with that and we're pleased with his progress. Um, the other resident pain, um, was discovered through self-management and discussion um, that it's the way she actually sleeps. So we've made alterations and again, we're using the app to promote exercise to help her. We're currently looking at which other residents we can 
we can um, help benefit. And we're hoping that all the staff will be able to use the app and pick up where others have left off with exercises, because obviously not everybody's on shift at the same time. Um, but the general consensus is staff involved are really pleased with the progress so far and would definitely recommend it to all the other care homes. Um, Karen Mundy, thank you so much for that. Um, I guess any questions, I think, if that's okay, Angela, is it? Yeah, um, I haven't got any yet. I, I think one key one from me is um, what do people need to do if they want to get involved in the pilot project? So right now we're just, as I say, piloting with Karen and Mandy, the two homes. Um, my sponsor, if you like, is Elizabeth Williams inside the CTG. So perhaps if I leave you, Angela, mine and Elizabeth's contact details, and perhaps if we can just collect from the forum here, those who would like to get involved, me and Elizabeth can then pull them together and then reach back out again or from the project. I think Elizabeth will be the, um, I guess, the, uh, the authority for me to, to allow me to go and do what I've been doing with Karen and Amanda, actually. So, of course, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that, but yeah, that we're, we're looking to find those who'd like to give it a go. We can just click them all in and then, um, then reach back out yeah. again directly. If people would like to, if they're, they're interested, either pop it in the chat box now, that would be great. Or if um, if you want to um, email me later, then and I'm angela.roberts at karensupportwest.com. Um, Alicia, can you see can you see in the chat box there, Gavin? Alethea has said, um, can this be used on generic care home devices? Yeah, so it can be used on all devices. So whether it be a smartphone, an iPad, uh, iPad or just a tablet, any tablet, an Android or Apple tablet, and a PC, yes. Um, I think with Karen and Mandy, I think the idea was to try and use on iPads because they're quite more mobile with those and bigger screens. But yes, all devices can be used. Right. And does it does it actually show uh, uh, to, how to do the exercises then on, on it? So so I guess on a bigger screen that would be quite helpful, wouldn't it? On yeah, and they're, they're 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 all done by ourselves. We both film the exercises based on our own knowledge of what we think the right an appropriate movement to do is at that time for that injury and we narrate them as well so we talk and show if you like at the same time uh trying to if you like give the viewer the knowledge to then try and repeat or do alongside and then just keep doing it yeah thank you i see i've got another couple of questions karen my colleague has said um is there a requirement for the dspt to be completed to receive the app this is the data security protection toolkit that's a really good question, actually, and all the personal stuff. So there's two or three sort of elements that I'll, I'll keep it brief. So one, we're currently covered for all that side of stuff with the CCG. We have a CCG-wide data protection agreement, uh, which now enables us, well, one, we to be clinically safe, but then two, for our management of, of any data. So we don't do anything with data other than use it for aggregate reporting and potentially for research with the CCG. So it doesn't get sold on anywhere or moved anywhere else other than just how people using the app. Um, so as it currently stands, no, I believe you're okay with that situation. Although if you do have your own DSP requirements for your organization, we can certainly have a look at that and see if we need to cover that. But currently I understand the CCG wide one covers you. And personal logins, it's a really good question as well. So what we're trying with Karen and Mandy actually is a login for the resident or a login for the care worker. Uh, and we think you, we, we're doing both at the moment uh, and we're going to try and create a situation where the care worker can actually log in on behalf of the resident and therefore the resident's information doesn't sort of go or flow anywhere, if you like, other than just inside the app for the care worker to use. Uh, but if you were using it, and you could use it, it's your own personal login you get given at the point of access by a GP, or by yourselves, or by us. Um, um, so yeah, so the data it stores can store the journey for each resident. So Mandy and Karen's examples, we need to go and sort of break it where um, we're just trying to develop work to enable that to work for each resident. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, I think 
time wise we better wrap this up now thank you um karen mandy and gavin and um, i just encourage everybody if, if you think that your service may be able to um you know might might be interested in getting involved in this it, it, it feels to me like one of these things that the more people who are involved the, the better gavin's putting his email there in the chat box um off you go <laughs> so thank, thank you. you all i'm going to hand over now to sarah which involves the um the share screen thing so if you bear with me everybody i will um get that underway how's that looking sarah do i need to um do that so, yeah how's that yeah perfect thank you very much so good morning everyone. My name is Sarah Ambe. I've been with Catalyst Care Group for only eight weeks prior, um, as the operations lead for the community services that we operate. Community services care at home in various areas of the country. We have two registered managers. I'm managing the, the registered managers across the group. We've got four at the moment looking at a fifth um, and we do a variety of complex care um, types of care in the home. Um, we are um, dealing with complex mental health, um, rapid response type of clients, uh, and there's a huge mixture of, of the people that we support. And um, leave complex care is more around mental health, complex care in Bristol, we have a complex care leaf in Exeter who's picking up more learning disabilities. I'm just going through all that. We have a nurse line community service. So that's really complex mental health that is nurse led, sometimes with clinical needs as well. So one of our clients has got um, suicide ideation, but also is peg fed. Um, sometimes high ratios of care to clients three to ones, four to ones, five. I've even seen a six to one recently. So it's not unusual um, to have those two. And, and as I talk through this presentation, you'll see sort of the whys of, of what, we're, what we're doing this for. Um, and we've just set up a new branch in the North of England called Unique Community Services. So um, I'm overseeing that. We've just had our first client, so a two to one with complex mental health, with learning disabilities. So it's, there's lots of crossovers there. The next slide, please. So um, a little bit about my background, and I thought I would share a personal story and journey about the reason why I do this role. I have a 30-year-old stepson, adopted son, um, called Adam, who has Down syndrome. Um, and that's only a small part of him. He also has complex clinical needs in that he's type 1 diabetic. Um, and although he does, it's quite interesting seeing um, the CQC presentation on diabetes, because although he knows to inject himself and how to do that properly, he really lacks capacity over knowing what a blood sugar monitor level. I mean, he, he can tell when he's hypo. He knows when he's hypo, um, but he needs support in, in enabling him to eat the right things. And, um, and sometimes he's very clever and a bit devious because he will sometimes pretend to be um, hypo, especially with new workers. Um, he likes to lie down. He loves the, the drama of casualty. So we had about 20 admissions to the BRI over a five year period when he was younger, that's thankfully stabilized with more robust boundaries. But um, yeah, we, we've had quite a journey with Adam. Um, he is under a dolls, I do his COP24 um, and I'm his nominated person for that. So um, looking after his best interests, which is to be under a dolls because he is a, a flight risk, he likes to run away. Um, but also, I think um, this pretending to be ill and pushing boundaries. But, but interestingly enough, COVID, um, he's done really well during COVID. And, um, you know, he's been on the clinically extremely vulnerable list for a long time. We've done the odd garden visit. Um, the journey has, has got better over the last few years where he's matured 
I'm showing little pictures. He loves Freddie Mercury. That was his 30th birthday in January. Worst day of the year, very cold. So we did a garden visit and he had his celiac as well. So he had a gluten-free Freddie Mercury birthday cake and there was great fun and, and hilarity um, with him dressing up. Um, and he is normally in normal times, loves going to the fleece and dancing in the mosh pit um, to Queen tribute bands. And we've actually on a couple of occasions had to give him full sugared coke just to keep his sugar level stable, um, you know, to <laughs> to keep him from not going hypo, such as his energy levels in uh, in dancing. Um, he's also godfather to my grandson, Cruz, who you can see there. Um, showing him how to play football. That was last um, summer when we were allowed to go and visit in the garden. And that's also um, been a brilliant thing for him. He's he's actually taken on that responsibility of being a godfather. He's always asking after his godson. So that's my why and the reason that I'm passionate about moving people into community settings where they're going to be in the care system a long time. They're going to need care for all of their lives. Now, I, I knew, and it was something my father said to me when I was younger. He said, when I was younger, I went to visit a farmer. I, I originate from Cornwall. And he said the one thing that was so sad was seeing a young man who'd lost both parents and he was totally at sea. He'd lost his his main carers in, in the home set in his living in his own home and you know that's what people did years ago whereas actually Adam's been in supported living since he was 20 and he's now 30 and you know there were always going to be teething troubles but for me Adam has meaningful life he's got a better I know, I know Covid's put a dampener on that but for me, Adam's got a better social life than I have. He's doing day activities and he belongs to um, Misfits Theatre Group. He He's always seeing his family in normal times um, and we do lots of things together. And it's a normal adult. You know, I've got uh, my youngest is due to go to uni in September. And I think, well, that's also now going to be an adult child relationship this this relationship with Adam is an adult child relationship we're not we're not actually I reflected that when he was living at home we were doing all the nasty bits of care now we're doing all the fun things and doing the stuff that our respite workers used to do for us so that you know I, I think for him he's happy he's settled and you know he's got people looking out for him and if something happened to me tomorrow I know my kids would look out would, would look out for him you know so that's my real big why. Thank you. Next slide. So um, after being a parent carer, my journey um, in the health and social care sector was around advocacy for parent carers. You know, we're not given a roadmap out of this stuff. We need to navigate and we have to fight and battle. Those are daily um, vocabularies that I hear from parent carers. Um, so my specialism, if you like, is, is children and young people. But having worked in this sector for a long time, those those um, those skills have, have transferred into all care and elderly care and looking after people with dementia as well. Um, so um, my last role before this was a, a, a large private provider and I had a, carried a registered manager. Uh, but prior to that, I worked for Health Watch, which is part of CQC. I call them the public face. And, and sadly, I don't think everybody knows about Health Watch. And when I've even spoken to some of my team, they didn't know until I came along that you've got that local um, presence as a health and social care watchdog. So I worked as I headed up the Bristol Health Watch for two years. And I also did seven months of secondment at Health Watch England in the CQC offices near Buckingham Palace, which was a huge privilege, but also we did lots of work on the NHS long-term plan. It was launched in the January and I went on secondment um, in the March where we did a lot of public engagement and research into what really mattered to the public and you know that the NHS long-term plan is looking at the next 10 years well, we're already two years into that and the direction of travel is very much about keeping people well I remember going to a BNSSG 
um, conference on frailty at MSHED a couple of years ago. And, you know, there's very much a, a reason to keep people living well. One of my last privileges before I, I joined Catalyst was was some um, under my registration, we had a, an elderly lady who had been under our care for five years and the carers had all stayed with this lady and she was living well in her own home. She she was only she only lost her mobility in the last couple of weeks of her life. And the carers were telling me that as she left this world, she was um, listening to her favourite hymns and um, you know, she they were singing pop songs from the 60s all the way through of what she loved because they knew her and she'd had that continuity of care. And it was extremely, you know, when I went to the Zoom funeral, um, the next of kin just paid tribute. So for me, that was a job, another job well done. So I've put a link into the NHS long term plan about primary and community services so um you know where that where that sits um so it's something i'm really passionate about is living well at home and we all know sometimes that especially with frailty that going to hospital is not a good thing and that the um frailty conference i went to you know that the, the statistics speak for themselves that if you go into hospital especially now in covid times that if we can keep people out of there that the the long-term outcomes and preservation of quality of life is a lot better so next slide please so yeah these are some of the reasons why that, that in, you know having that commitment within the long-term planning community services it stops bed blocking in hospitals that you know frailty can worsen so I've already touched on that and you know I don't know about you but I'd rather die in my own home when the time comes with the people around me that I love and it's I know that's not for everyone um but you know it's about giving those choices isn't it and you know for us as well as an organization we're about getting people out the NHS is committed to stop institutional Organization, you know, the Winterbourne views of this world to keep people, you know, we've had great impacts in not warehousing people, you know, if somebody starts a three to one, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to stay at a three to one, you know, we've gone from three to one to one to one. So it's showing that return to baseline behaviour. And, you know, one of our guys, we recently did a case study, he went fishing, and he was self harming and doing all sorts of dangerous challenging behaviors before and, and another one I heard yesterday had gone to a climbing center now that those things are starting to open up again so um, it's been a huge challenge for us all hasn't it COVID but I think now with things opening up that you know if we're listening to what people liked before they became poorly that we can we can start wrapping that stuff around them um, on their road to recovery and you know it's 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 just all about long-term living well in the community next slide please so how are we trying to do that how can we all do that well I think it's about making a long-term investment in what can be a very transient workforce so like nobody likes and, and if I think back to Adam he hates it if somebody leaves his service you know it's it's about creating the right environment for people who want to stay in those jobs that they take real pride that that being a carer is is a profession in itself and you know we're doing everything we can to make sure that from a bottom up approach that our clinicians are are really um valued for what they do and that's going to be so transformational for you know the better terms and conditions for them and let's see what the government's paper on that um comes out like if you know i always say if somebody is an hca in the nhs they and they go sick or you know they need time off they get paid but not in the private sector so not in social care so let's see what happens there and you know it's about supporting the families with holistic support you know not just being um an advocate for the client but you know a lot of our families live with their mums and dads and, and you know I know from personal experience how challenging being a parent carer is and we need to look after the parent carers because if they fall over and are not well then the whole thing's gonna un unravel so you know it's about how we how we do that better 
Um, and of course, with all of this, it's about training and development and sharing best practice across the sector. So, you know, for me, it's that that passion of doing things and driving, you know, quality throughout um, the communities that we serve. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to share a few things that we did at Health Watch that is all about communities and especially those that felt really isolated and what we did with the BNSSG footprint mm -hmm. and the AWP Mental Health Partnership. We did a whole focus um, of a year of mental health during my time and we questioned the people of Bristol and we, we also did engagement events with seldom heard, hard to reach communities. We knew where to go in BAME communities, for example. We, we couldn't even use the word mental health in those communities. We actually did questionnaires and we called it a wellbeing um, survey. So, and we got some great results. And we also did some little community pot initiatives and small micro pots of funding. And we did some work with AWP and um, Second Step on walking football. Um, and people who were living a long time with severe mental illness. And um, also with Off the Record as well, the, child, the Children and Young People's Mental Health Service, um, we did, and some of these reports can be found on the Health Watch website. And Health Watch England actually have a library of reports. So the chances are someone in, in England has done a survey on something that we might have um, come across in our work. Um, the off the record piece was the natural health service, which was about going out in nature and walks and um, how that can improve people's mental health. Um, and we also worked with what well, it was Bristol Community Health at the time, but now it would be Serona on the community navigator projects around reducing loneliness and isolation in the community. So. We all live in our communities, we all live in our own networks. And for me, it's about reaching out and, and understanding what these impacts were on the community. For the, the walking football, we went to NHS England Southwest and presented our findings. And I think some of that was then commissioned into some of the, the long-term treatments um, because it actually helped people feel better. There was a reduction in medication based on the findings and people had lost weight and felt generally healthier and they'd started to make friends with people who'd gone through similar experiences. Um, so I've also put a link on there to stuff that we did around mental health because it pays reference to some of those projects. Next slide, please. That's it. So I hope you found that interesting. And um, if you've got any questions, then please fire away. Thank you, Sarah. I think what I'd better do is uh, stop the screen share. Um, I just will ask my, my colleague, Karen, if there are any questions that I can't see. Um, I'll just leave your, your slide up there for a bit. Give Karen a chance. No, there's, there's no questions on the... Uh, oh, thanks, Karen. No questions at all. <laughs> You're off the hook, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I'm going to have to shoot off in a minute. I'm really sorry. I've okay, got another not meeting. To worry. Okay, I just thank need you. To get out of this. Sorry, I I am. Um, uh, if you can all see me, there we go. I'm back. Thank you. Um, okay, for those uh, here, thank you, Sarah. That was thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thanks to Laura. Um, and or I can see that. Um, you've put uh, an, a link in there on gathering people's views on uh, health and care for CQC. So there's another link for everybody. We will put uh, the resources up. Um, you've also seen the links from Gavin um, for the, uh, the Get You Better app. Um, so we'll get all the resources up on the website together with the recording for today. So it just remains for me to say thank you to Laura Thanks for, for joining us again. We really appreciate having you on the call. Um, to um, Amanda, to Karen, Gavin, I think he's he's gone, but thanks anyway, Gavin, and to Sarah. Thank you all. And hopefully we'll see um, some, if not all of you, on the 25th of May for the session on student nurse placements in social care. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.